the case of the dishonest scrivener, Governor Morris, the creation of the Federalist Constitution and its laws. So, first of all, that's the dishonest scriv scrivener. Uh, Governor Morris, he's seated on the left on this page. Um, so, so what this is about is at the very end of the Constitutional Convention, very end, they don't have a constitution. They've been debating for four months. Um, they have a draft that is five weeks old. They have been arguing about it, voting things up, voting things down. Five committees, they don't have a constitution. And so they create a committee of style to bring it all together. And style and arrangement, supposed to be style and arrangement. They work over three days and they produce what's our constitution. Uh, you know, everybody's exhausted and they just want to get home. So when they get the committee report, in three days, they very quickly review the Constitution. They finalize it, and it's our Constitution. Governor Morris, who's the key player on the committee of style, the drafter of the Constitution is, I'm going to be talking to you, he's a dishonest scrivener. So he's supposed to be just codifying and putting the polish on the Constitution. Instead, and the, the, the article is online, I'm going to give a you know, overview of it. He makes 15 significant changes in the Constitution, 15 substantive changes that reflect what he's fought for and lost <laughs> uh, on the constitutional floor. It's, a, it's extraordinary. Uh, it, you know, he's, the, he's a big nationalist. He's a champion of the executive. He's a champion of the federal judiciary. He uh, fights for private property. He's the only one of all of the delegates who fights, who attacks slavery as unjust. And on each of those, he makes changes to the Constitution that are subtle and that people don't pick up on and that become our constitutional text. That's the first part. And then the second part is what happens. And I'm going to talk about how he, on behalf of the Federalists, wins the text and then how he, really because of his post-convention career and his lack of concern with his place in history, loses the battle for constitutional meaning. So Federalists win the text, but then Republicans lose the, win the battle for original understanding. So that's the talk. And again, that's Governor Morris on the left. OK, how does he do it? Okay. So what the, the, the key document is what's called the committee, the report of the Committee of Style and Arrangement. So a couple of things. So when you think back about the constitutional history that you have, when you, you know, starting when you're in grammar school and that you have in college and law school, it's got a couple of basic themes. The first theme is it's about the Virginians. Okay? And that's because Madison's taking the notes, right? And it's his story, and then he lives the longest. And then his notes are published. So it's all about the Virginians. If the Virginians get together before the convention starts, that the convention begins with the Virginia plan being presented by John Randolph, who we heard about before, Edmund Randolph, rather. And then two big floor debates. One debate is over, is representation by the number of people, or is it by the states? And there's the compromise, big states, small states, Senate and House, right? And then there's the big fight over slavery. You know, is, it going to, is there going to be representation just by free inhabitants, or is it going to be slave, pe and slave people and free inhabitants? And there's a compromise, the three-fifths clause. That's a standard account. And there are two ways in which it's wrong. One is, it's not just the Virginians. So if you actually go and you look who's in the room when they're planning the, what becomes the Virginia plan, it's the Virginians, but it's also two delegates from Pennsylvania, James Wilson and Governor Morris. And when the Virginia plan is presented to the Constitution, the first person who gets up and says, this is fabulous, is Governor Morris. It's a clearly a choreographed team effort, right? And then who speaks the most? Is it James Madison, the founder of the Constitution, the father of the Constitution? No. He's third. Number two, James Wilson. Who speaks the most? Governor Morris, right? 
which is a real tribute to Governor Morris, because among other things, he's somebody who, you know, everybody else is concerned with their place in history. He's concerned, he wants a good constitution, but he also, he's a man of business. He takes two weeks off in the middle to kind of deal with his business affairs. So whenever he's there, he's talking, right? So he's the one who talks more than anybody else. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is, it's not about the floor debates. It's about the committees, right? Anybody who knows Congress knows how important the committees is. There are 12 committees, and the text that we as lawyers construe is almost all drafted in the committees. And the most important committee, I think, is the Committee of Style. Very end of the Constitution. Again, supposed to be style and arrangement. They write the Constitution in three days, and that becomes our final Constitution. It's about the committees, and the most important committee is the Committee of Style and Arrangement. Now, unlike other committees, we do not have contemporary diaries. We don't have drafts of the, of the Constitution as they're writing it. But we do know that there are five members, Rufus King of Massachusetts, Alexander Hamilton of New York, James Wilson of Pennsylvania, William Johnson of Connecticut and Governor Morris of Pennsylvania. James Wilson, sorry, James Wilson is there along the side. He's not actually on the committee, but he's part of the negotiation. And of this group, we know that Morris is actually the drafter. And we know that because he writes letter afterwards. That, doc, this, that document, the Constitution, was written by the fingers which write this letter. And James Madison, and I have to say, there's incredible tension over time between Madison and Morris. They come to hate each other. But Madison acknowledges that Morris was the drafter. The finish, and he underscores finish, given the style and arrangement of the Constitution fairly belongs to the pen of Mr. Morris, right? So he's the drafter. Morris is the drafter. Over the three days, he's the drafter of the Constitution. Now, as I said, when they come with the draft of the Constitution, the over three days they review it, nobody, if you read Madison's notes, nobody says, hey, wait a minute, some of the substance has changed. Nobody says that. But there's some evidence that there is focus on one particular clause. Okay, this is the general welfare clause. So what I've done is I've taken the broad side of the, of the, of the, of the committee's report, and I've blown up the, general, the, um, the, uh, the clause about the general welfare. And what I wanted to do is, and again, Read my article, it's on SSRN, <laughs> fabulous. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to kind of parse all the text, I just wanna give the broad ideas. So what goes in on the general welfare clause to the committee? So again, they're supposed to be just taking what they've got and polishing it, okay? And it's the legislature shall have power to lay and collect debts, duties, imposts, and excises, comma, comma, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense of general welfare in the United States. So what's this? This is about the taxing authority. Why do, what is the taxing authority for? They, they tax for the general welfare and common defense, right? But what comes out of the committee's style, this is why all your blue booking was so invaluable. <laughs> the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, semicolon, <laughs> to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare in the United States. What had been a clause about the taxing power becomes clause about two things, about the taxing power, and it's essentially a plenary grant of power, right? The Congress now has, can pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. So I mean, what Morris, Morris is the big nationalist at the convention, and he's lost. And now at the last minute, punctuation. But he doesn't get away with it. Roger Sherman. <laughs> okay, now I just want to call attention to the pictures. Governor Morris, remember, smiling, happy guy. Roger Sherman, he's angry. He's caught a typo. So we don't know this from the convention notes, but 10 years after, in 1798, there's a debate in Congress about the General Welfare Clause, and Albert Gallatin, congressman from uh, Pennsylvania, who, who with Ma Madison is really the brains of the Republicans, he says, during the Constitutional Convention, Governor Morris changed the comma in the General Welfare Clause to a semicolon. But Roger Sherman spotted the trick. 
that's the word, spotted the trick and got the language and punctuation changed back. So we actually don't have, if you read Madison's notes, there's nothing about Sherman calling attention to this. But if you look at what goes into the Committee of Style is a comma, its report is a semicolon. And if you look at the Constitution, it's a comma. So that raises the question, what's going on? Is this isolated? Did Morris, in fact, change this clause? Or was it just a typo? And then was it part of a larger scheme? And we don't have any response at the time, because Sherman is dead, and Morris is in Europe. So he never comments on it. He's in Europe a lot. <laughs> so now, nobody before me, and I find this amazing, but that's maybe because I'm obsessed by this. Nobody has ever gone through and looked at what goes into the committee and what comes out and written an article or a book that compares the two. Okay, the one person who talks about it is Clinton Rossiter. This is a, one of the great constitutional history, 1787. It's what I read in high school. And he doesn't kind of detail it, but he says in his book, 1787, hey, I looked at this, I compared it, Morris was fine. Uh, Morris was a faithful servant of the committee and the committee of the convention. So nobody has ever before argued that Morris syst and shown that Morris systematically changed the text to win where he'd lost on all the issues that were big to him. Now, there are four cases that the Supreme Court has had in the last 50 years that in which one of the parties has said, hey, the Committee of Style changed the text. And that where the court has had to, had to choose between the language that went into the committee and the language that came out of the committee. What it's found each time is, we're going to go with the language that went into the committee, not the Constitution that was ratified, <laughs> but the language that went into the committee, the rough draft that nobody ever saw. Right? So this is Powell, not obscure cases, Powell versus McCormick, okay, Warren for the court. Uh, we're looking at the rough draft, Committee of Style and Arrangement. It's just supposed to be about style and arrangement. If they did anything more, it's ultra virus. So the rough draft is the Trump. Now, in some ways, that's not surprising. This is really kind of at the, at the origins of originalism. Now we look at text, not drafter's intent. Jefferson Powell convinced us it wasn't drafter's intent. But the Supreme Court still takes this approach. So this is the most recent one, Utah versus Evans, which is a census case, which is about actual enumeration, which is language that the committee added. And writing for the court, Breyer says, Forget actual enumeration, committee of style and arrangement, style and arrangement. We're going to just reject what they added because they were just supposed to be about style and arrangement, right? They, so the court in the most recent decisions, going back to the rough draft, only one justice has disagreed, and that's Justice Thomas, who says in dissent, I focus on the words of the adopted Constitution, okay? But he's alone. Justice Scalia has never said that. The only person who's ever taken that position is... Justice Thomas. And the, these are the modern histories. They're three really excellent uh, constitutional histories of the past uh, 15 years. Michael Klarman of Harvard, Richard Beeman of Penn, uh, David Seward, an extraordinary independent scholar. Um, they, all say, they don't even recognize that this is an issue. They don't recognize that anybody's called into question Morris's integrity. Uh, and so David Stewart, again, this is a great book, but he says, this draft, the Committees of South draft, had to be faithful to the constant convention's actions. Morris could be trusted to do that. Well, he couldn't. <laughs> okay, now, a little bit of my biography. Why am I obsessed by Governor Morris? First of all, I'm from Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, as I'm sure you know, it's a military capital of the American Revolution. This is actually kind of relatively humble. Normally, we Morristonians say the military capital of the revolution. And when I was a boy, the Governor Morris Inn opened up. Okay? This was a big deal. It was the first hotel in Morristown. This is, a, this is the local newspaper. New Jersey's first all new, all new hotel in a quarter of a century. Big deal. So we're all Governor Morris. Now, those of you who are Roger Sherman-like proofreaders would say, hey, wait a minute. 
Governor Morris, that's not the way he spells his name. <laughs> well, they actually meant to name it after our Governor Morris. They just misspelled his name. Now, I just want to say that's actually part of kind of the Morristown brand. If you go to, um, <laughs> if you go to the Governor Morris Inn, which is still open, and you go to the restaurant, Copland's, it's named after Aaron Copeland. They misspelled his name, too. <laughs> OK, now, who was Morris? Now, Morris is really, at this point, he's one of kind of the third level founders. He's not like a Hamilton or a Madison or a Washington. He's not even like um, you know, a Mason or a Randolph. He's like a third level founder. There are two things that people remember about Morris, right? Two things. One is he is. I talked about Richard Beeman, one of the classic constitutional histories. In that constitutional history, he says he refers to Governor Morris as quote a serial philanderer. So his that and that's actually a large part of what the histories focus on. If you look at William Howard Adams's biography, which is the standard biography, academic biography, if you go to the index under romances, under Morris, he's got 37 pages. <laughs> under committee of style. Nothing. <laughs> okay, so serial philanderer. And then the other thing that he's famous for is he's got a peg leg. And, you know, there's a debate about, among historians, about how he gets the peg leg. Um, but one of the stories, which is the one he encourages, is that it's linked to his being a serial philanderer and that he shattered his leg jumping out of a window to avoid a husband. So that's what people know about Governor Morris. But, what should you know? First of all, he's physically dominant, right? If you think about the Federal Constitutional Convention, if you go to Philadelphia, it's a small room. And most of them were actually not huge. So James Madison was 5'4 and under 100 pounds. Alexander Hamilton, 5'7, very slight. Commanding is George Washington. This is the classic statue of George Washington. Um, it's in the Virginia State Capitol, but it's the one that's copied everywhere. So if you go to our, the nation's capital, if you go to Independence Hall, if you go to parks across the country, they're all copies of this statue. Now, the face is Washington. So Jean Houdin, the great French sculptor, Goes to, goes to Mount Vernon, makes a life mask of Washington. That's Washington's head. And Marshall, everybody says, this is Washington. It's in fact, the head is Washington, the body is Governor Morris. <laughs> and that's because, first of all, um, there, are two, there are two kind of things to highlight about that. First, it's, you know, it's just, He's in, he's the ambassador to France when Houdin is doing the, the, the sculpture. They're the same size. Morris and Washington are both 6'4". Think about how, that, how big that is at the time. So he knows that they're at the right time. Morris gets a little irritated that he's going to Houdin all the time. He refers in his letters to the fact that he's the mannequin. Now, the other thing, though, is that um, Franklin has a better body. So Washington is, by all contemporaneous accounts, pear-shaped. Um, don't mean to speak ill of the dead. <laughs> but, you know, and that's, that's actually good if you ride a horse, because it <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, if you're looking at, are you heroic, that's Morris, right? And everybody at the time says, he really, he's got, he has command. Right? So he's, got, he's, he's big, he's got physical command. He's an aristocrat. Uh, so if you're from, if you know New York City, Morrisania in the Bronx, that's his family's estate. Uh, this is the house torn down about 100 years ago. So he's an aristocrat, but he doesn't inherit any money. He's from the second family. His father, first wife, the first, first family gets all the money. Governor is a child of the second marriage after the first wife dies. He gets nothing. 
He becomes rich through being a very successful lawyer and then businessman, but no inherited money. Okay, other things. He has a gift for friendship, and his friends love him. So when I went back before, and he, the first image, Governor Morris and Robert Morris. So you, everybody knows, not everybody, but everybody in kind of my line of work, uh, knows that uh, Robert Morris went bankrupt. He was the financier of the revolution. He was the superintendent of finance during the revolution. He goes bankrupt. He goes to debtor's prison. What people generally don't know is Governor Morris, who was assistant superintendent of finance, works with him, and then as a business partner, rescues him. He pays to get him out of debtor's prison, and because he has huge debts, he gets him an annuity that can't be seized and buys a house for Robert Morris to live in. For Washington, he's like a son. Washington, the, the Washington and he have a father-son relationship. At the end of the Philadelphia Convention, for example, they leave Philadelphia together, and he's Hamilton's closest friend. Uh, when he's shot and dying, he's the one who Liza asks to come to the deathbed. So he's a great friend. He is brilliant, according to everyone. Madison and Hamilton, who agree on nothing, both call him a genius. And he is an extraordinary writer of every kind. So he has experience as a legislative drafter when he's in the New York Provincial Congress, when he's in the Continental Congress, when he's assistant superintendent of finance. He drafts the critical legislation. He's a co-author as a very young man of the New York State Constitution. You know, the report that he writes as assistant superintendent of finance, dry report, it gives us two words that everybody knows. He invents the word cent, and he says we should call the basic monetary unit for the United States government dollar. So he has extraordinary gifts at very technical writing, and he's an enormously skilled rhetorician. So if you read the, 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 if you read the speeches in, in Farron's reports of the Constitutional Convention, most of them are really dry. You know, Wilson and Morris, very scholarly. Morris is extraordinary. He's funny. He's angry. He's emotionally powerful in a way that nobody can touch. And as evidence of how rhetorically powerful he is, when Hamilton decides that he's going to write the Federalist Papers, he turns to Governor Morris to be his co-author. So we all think of Madison, Jay, and Hamilton. Madison is the replacement after Morris says no, maybe the most famous understudy in American history. <laughs> so he's brilliant. He's a gifted writer. The dark side is that people suspect his integrity for a number of reasons. Part of it is his personal life. Part of it is some people think that as assistant superintendent of finance, he benefited himself financially. Most important, in the 1783, there's what's called the Newburgh Conspiracy, which is a planned mutiny of the officers to demand back pay. And the idea is that they will march on Congress and essentially force Congress out of panic to demand a taxing authority. And all the evidence is, and it's widely known at the time, that Governor Morris is the one behind it. So there's real questions about his integrity. So there he is with Robert. So three quick shots. So William Pierce, a Georgia delegate, writes a series of many biographies about all of the other delegates. This is what he writes about Morris. One of those geniuses, that word again, in whom every species of talents combined to render him conspicuous and flourishing in public debate. He winds through all the mazes of rhetoric and throws around him such a glare that he charms, captivates, and leads away the senses of all who hear him. This is the, the French embassy also writes many biographies. This is his. Celebrated lawyer, one of the best heads on the continent, but without morals, and if one believes his enemies without principles. <laughs> so basically, everybody agrees he's without morals. <laughs> the division is over the principles matter. All right, so let's quickly go 
to Max Farin. So Max Farin is really probably the best constitutional historian. He's the one, the debates that we read today, he's the one who brings them all together about 100 years ago. He also writes uh, a history of the Constitutional Convention. And this is what he says. Governor Morris was probably the most brilliant member of the convention. I just want to stop for a second. Not Madison, not Hamilton, not Franklin. The guy who writes what I think is the best constitutional history says, Morris is the smartest. And then he adds, sharp-witted, clever, startling in his audacity, and with a wonderful command of language, he was admired more than he was trusted. <laughs> All right. So let's look at some of the texts. Again, I have 15 examples in the SRN article that you'll all be reading this evening. <laughs> um, but let's start with the preamble, OK? What goes into the committee? We, the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Providence plantations. And then what's the ending of it? Do ordain and establish the following constitution? Becomes the most famous part of the constitution. This is all the committee's held. This is all Morris. We, the people of the United States, it's a national statement. Not a, we're not the people of the states. We're the people of the nation. In order to, and then what are the ends? There were no ends before, except to have a constitution. <laughs> to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. Okay, he has defined we are a nation, and this is what we're about. That's all Morris. But we also say, well, you know, it's nice. It's a rhetorical flourish. Nobody really cares. What that misses is that in the early debates about the Constitution, the, the Federalists went again and again to the preamble, not as a rhetorical flourish, but as a grant of power. So. This is just one example. Congressman Fisher Ames, no relation, uh, who's one of his best friends, argues, why do we have the power to create a bank? The preamble. Chisholm versus Georgia. Why does the United States government have jurisdiction over the state of Georgia? James Wilson, who's on, who works with the committee. The preamble. So we have this sense that the preamble is just a hortatory flourish, not for the Federalists at the founding. That's example one. The Contracts Clause. Okay. The Contracts Clause is debated once on the House floor, and it is voted down. It is voted down before the Committee of Style begins its work. Now, Morris actually speaks against it, but I think he votes, it, votes against it because it's too broad on the statute of limitations. It comes back in the Committee of Style report. It's been voted down. It comes back. And I want to highlight, not just that he's brought it back, but one significant change. OK, what's been proposed is that states can't, this is the top, interfere with or affect private contracts. Private contracts. Now we go to the actual report of the committee, which is our language of the Constitution today. States can't alter or impair the obligation of contracts. The word private contracts has disappeared. And this is consistent with Morris's views elsewhere, because he thinks when states grant corporate charters, they're done. They can't revise it. So his dropping of the word private is very intentional, because he wants it to reach contracts that the state has with private individuals. And so Fletcher versus Peck, when Marshall reads the contracts clause that way, most historians say, oh, he's departing from the original understanding. Because in the ratifying convention, most people say, oh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't reach state contracts with corporations. Marshall is just carrying out Morris's language, totally intentional. OK, John talked a little bit about my work on judicial review. The standard view a generation, two generations ago, was Marbury was created out of whole cloth. These are kind of Van Alstine and Bickle are the two classic statements of that. Um, 
you know, I've shown that there were about 31 cases before Marbury in which judicial review was exercised, but it's also in the constitutional text. This is the Morris' speech on judicial review at the convention. He argues in favor of judicial review. But when they go into the committee of style, there's no text about judicial review. But then he makes a change. The clause that goes in is that the Constitution, and I've underscored it here, shall be the supreme law of the several states. He changes it and makes it the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. And then that becomes by Wilson, again, the basis of the exercise of judicial review in Hayburn's case. And it's also used in a secondary way by Marshall and Marbury versus Madison. So another change. He's added language to create the basis for judicial review. That's not the common wisdom. The common wisdom, you know, most people think judicial review is created by Marbury. He's added language. Okay, the final example I'm going to give it some detail on is the, the, the judicial vesting clause. So the general understanding, the common wisdom is, this is the way it works. Wilson and Madison say, got to have lower federal courts. They lose. The countermeasure is, you'll have low, the state courts will be the lower courts, and then it'll go to the Supreme Court. Then Madison and, and, and Wilson come in and offer what's called the Madisonian Compromise, which is Congress can but doesn't have to create lower federal courts. Okay, that's relevant for things like jurisdiction stat stripping statutes, right? Morris wants lower federal courts, and he changes the language. Yep, oh, sorry. Um, so he changes it from, in such inferior courts, a shell when necessary from time to time, and they may not be necessary. That's what goes into the committee. He changes it to, in such... Uh, in such, a, uh, in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So he changes the language. And then, in the initial debates, again, the Federalists use that language and they say, the language is clear. You've got to have lower federal courts. It's not discretionary. Madison argues contrary to that. He says, they're a good idea. You don't have to have it. Federalists say, no, you've got to have it. That's what the constitutional text is clear including Morris in his brief term in the Senate, argues that, okay? So those are the, now the Supreme Court talks about the Madisonian Compromise. These are our two textualists on the court, uh, Scalia and Thomas. They both say, when the argument is raised, oh no, that argument fails because there's the Madisonian Compromise. They don't realize that Morris didn't follow the Madisonian Compromise. He changed it. So that's, um, that's the, the, those are my basic examples. The preamble, the contracts clause, the law of the lands clause, the judicial vesting clause, in each case, he's changed it to get an end that he wants. And also, federalists use it to argue for what they want. And the common understanding today, totally against the federalists. No judicial review, Madisonian compromise, Contracts clause really should, was just about private contracts. The preamble is a tortitory. So he's changed the language. He's given language that the Federalists rely on, and we ignore that today. Just a couple of other examples. The vesting clauses he creates, unitary executive people make a big deal out of the difference between the fact that Article I says Congress shall have all legislative powers here and granted. Article II says the President shall have all executive powers. That becomes, that's huge. Myers, it's very important for all the unitary executive theorists when they argue for a broad presidential power. Morris, champion of the broad executive, he puts that difference in. Here and granted, he adds that to the vesting clause in Congress. And then his buddy, Alexander Hamilton, his best friend, relies on that in the first big debate about foreign affairs to say that the president has broad powers. How do we know that, says Hamilton? Because here and granted. Congress just has legislative powers here and granted. The president has all executive powers. So Morris has created leg legislation that, that Hamilton is relying on. Too quickly, Morris has a, is a big pro-impeachment guy, thinks it should be broad grounds of impeachment. He then, in the impeachment clause, he changes. What goes in is high crimes and misdemeanors against the United States. He makes high crimes and misdemeanors. He removes against the United States. 
which is actually very important in, for example, the Clinton, uh, you know, when the question is, you know, President Clinton lied before a grand jury, it's not, it's not a crime against the United States. How much effect do we give the, the omission? Most, most historians say, we'll go back to the prior draft, but that's not what Morris wanted. The other one, which may become a big issue, but nobody's focused on yet, uh, this is the presidential succession clause. Uh, what goes in is the legislature may declare by law what officer of the United States shall act as president. Um, so what that means is that that's a term of art. Officer of the United States is members of the executive and judiciary. It's not members of Congress. Uh, so he changes that to um, what officer he's gotten rid of the, of the United States. So Nancy Pelosi is in the line of succession because of Governor Morris. Final point. Uh, he's the only one who speaks against slavery on the convention floor. Domestic slavery was a nefarious institution. It was the curse of heaven on the states where it prevailed. It was a horror. He talks about, uh, you know, this is an extraordinary power, that the admission of slaves into the representation means that the inhabitants of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity tears away his fellow humans, fellow creatures from their dearest connections and damns them to the most cruel bondages. Nobody else speaks against slavery at the convention. And then in the Fugitive Slave Clause, he removes the word justly. So the, the original, what goes into the committee, talks about uh, the person justly claiming their service or labor, he takes out justly. That's critical. When the abolitionists argue the Constitution recognizes slavery, but it doesn't endorse it, it's because of Governor Morris. So, what happens? Okay. Again, what are his goals? Pro-executive, pro-judiciary, strong national government, protection of private property, anti-slavery. He gets language in on all of them, and then the common wisdom today is that's not part of the original understanding. Why? And I think it's because, I mean, it, a number of reasons, but one is because of our worship of people who we consider the great founders, right? And Madison plays it exactly right. He writes the notes and then doctors them to advance his interests. He then has a great career, member of Congress, Secretary of State, President, his notes are then published. He becomes iconic. He becomes the father of the Constitution. So when there are disagreements about what the Constitution means, well, Madison's the father of the Constitution. This is what he says. The preamble is hortatory, right? Madison plays it right. Okay, there are two other founders who could have been the father of the Constitution and who talk more than Madison, Wilson and Morris. Just a few words about Wilson. Wilson explodes. Wilson cares too much for his place in history. So he wants to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Washington will not, he puts him on the court, but will not make him Chief Justice. I think partly because he's socially awkward. And, and, and Wilson is angry. And he wants to be one of the founders. He wants to be one of the premier founders. And if he can't be one of the premier founders, he will be rich. And so he starts to invade on the Supreme Court. He invests in real estate aggressively. And there's a time in which he's one of the five richest people in the country. But then the market turns, the panic of 1796, his creditors call in on his debts. He has no liquidity. He's sent to a bankruptcy prison. He gets out, but he travels the circuit as a member of the Supreme Court, hiding from his creditors. And he dies over a tavern in ignominy. So nobody says, this is what Wilson thought, because he's become ignominious. Whereas Morris is forgotten. Why? Now, and I just want to say, first of all, he did have a take on this stuff. If he'd endured, this is a letter that he writes. And what he's saying is, when you're interpreting the Constitution, don't look at the drafter's intent or the ratifier's intent. That's confusing. <laughs> look 
look at the words. Why does he say that? Because they're his words. <laughs> okay, so even though he thinks that, it doesn't become a powerful voice because he disappears from the public after the convention. He's the only one of the major founders who doesn't go back and participate in a state ratifying convention. Hamilton goes to New York. Madison goes to Virginia. Wilson goes to Pennsylvania. He goes back to business. The only record we have of him writing anything down, he goes to Virginia to visit his friend, uh, Thomas Randolph, stays at his house, goes to the Virginia ratifying convention, writes poems making fun of the Virginia delegates. Right? That's the only thing that we have from him during the ratifying debates. Then he goes to Europe. Uh, he does business in, he's Washington's representative in England, but he also has business. He becomes ambassador to France during the French Revolution. After he's, after he's pushed out by the Jeffersonian, he stays in Europe making money. Then he comes back. He's briefly in the Senate. And one of the things that, that tells you a lot about Morris is he's always elected to office because he's so capable and he's never reelected. <laughs> so he's, he's very briefly in the Senate. And then when he loses reelection, he returns to private life. He makes some important contributions. Again, if you're in Manhattan, the grid, the avenues and the streets, He's the one who designs that. Erie Canal, he's the major figure in the creation of the Erie Canal. But mostly he's focused on making money. And then, at the age of 57, he gets married. But first, I just want to, this is Teddy Roosevelt, who, this is what he says about Morris. And Teddy Roosevelt writes a biography of Morris. And I think, of all the biographies, he's the only one who gets Morris. Because he looks around, he goes, aristocratic? Domineering, smart, trying to get whatever he wants. That's a pretty impressive combination. He sees himself in Morris. So when he writes a biography of Morris, there has never been an American statesman of keener intellect or more brilliant, again, that word, genius. Had he possessed but a little more steadiness and self-control, he would have stood among the two or three very foremost. But he doesn't. He returns to private life. Everybody else is concerned with their legacy. He's concerned with himself. And building a nation is just one chapter of his life. He's got a vision, but it's just one chapter of his life. And then at the age of 57, he marries, this is not a great slide, Nancy Randolph. Okay. Now, whenever I tell this story, people go like, hey, that'd be a great rap, rap opera. Right? I hope so. <laughs> I hope I get some of the royalties. <laughs> but if his story is a great rap opera, even more powerful is the story, which is truly operatic, of the woman he marries and Nancy Randolph Morris. So just very briefly. So she's from one of, she's another Randolph. When he's in Virginia staying at Thomas Randolph's house, she's a teenager. Then Randolph's wife dies, he gets remarried. And the second wife and he push the kids out of the house. And they force Nancy and Judith, her sister, into a marriages that they don't want with two cousins, Richard and Theodoric Randolph. Theodoric, Nancy's fiance, dies. She goes to live with Judith and Richard. She becomes pregnant, probably by him. She either gives birth or has a miscarriage, and he is tried for infanticide. He hires John Marshall and Patrick Henry, and he gets acquitted. She, so then they all are living together, Judith and Nancy and Richard in the same house. And then two years later, he dies. And some people think it's natural causes. Some people think Judith poisoned him. Some people think Nancy poisoned him. After a couple more years, Judith kicks her sister out of the house. She's an outcast in Virginia society. She makes her way north. We don't know how she survived. And then she meets Governor Morris. And Morris is looking for somebody to run his house. And he says, would you run my house? And she moves in and she runs the house and they fall in love. And she tells him this story. And he accepts it. 
he's a little bit worried about the poison. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he writes a letter to John Marshall, the lawyer, and he says, I don't want you to break attorney-client privilege, but you are the attorney. And as a fellow Federalist, I'm thinking of marrying Nancy Randolph. Would that be a mistake? <laughs> and John Marshall writes back and he says, absolutely, go ahead. And Morris marries Nancy Randolph. And they have a child, Governor Morris I. Uh, he dies about four years later. Um, if you go to if you go to the Bronx, St. Anne's in the Bronx, which is later built by Governor Morris I in honor of his mother, Nancy Ann, um, is Governor's tomb. And the inscription was written by his wife. And it, you know, if you read tombs at the time, you know, they're mostly you know, about horrible things happening. This is unique. It's about love. Conjugal affection consecrates this spot where the best of men was laid. And the last writings that we have of Governor Morris are poems that he wrote about his love for his wife and his child. That's St. Anne's. And this is his philosophy. To try to do good, to avoid evil, a little severity for oneself, a little indulgence for others, this is the means to obtain some good result out of our poor existence. To love one's friends, to be beloved by them, this is the means to brighten it. Now, I don't mean to kind of be too maudlin. He did try to steal the Constitution. <laughs> but I think you can get a sense of who he was by looking again at kind of the classic portraits of this period. Robert and Robert Morris and Governor Morris. James, Ran James Madison, looking off to the right to posterity. Hamilton, same pose. Washington, same pose. The totally different. This is the only major picture of a framer with a friend. And they seem to be enjoying each other's company. So the in, one of the enduring messages of understanding Morris is that while all the other founders cared about their place in posterity, he cared more broadly, in part about the nation, but in part about all the personal things that mattered to him. And so that's really what this talk is about. It's about recovering Morris and seeing him where he's always been present. but we've never known of his influence. Thank you all.